Eh, Välkommen eh, alla sammen. Det är er ett helt eh, överväldigande uppmöte. Eh, lovar gott för de nästa dagarna för eh, Coconomics. Um, I hope you excuse me for doing a little bit in Norwegian before yeah, it we start. It sounds like the English played backwards yeah. on an old record player on a record. Ehm, för mig ska snacka med Steve Keen som är er professor i ekonomi på Kingston University i London. Så vill jag bara minna om att inte med färdiga här så ska Steve ha en introduktion till filmen Inside Job som är er kanske den bästa dokumentären som är er lagt om finanskrisen. Det sker på Oljemuseet och det är er gratis. Det är er starkt att anbefala till de som inte har fått med sig den filmen. Um, before we start, uh, also I wanted to apologize for the horrible weather. Uh, you I, being I, I, Australian I, and everything. I've been in Norway on, on about 20 mm. occasions. Okay, so you I've used to it. a complete range, mainly in Trondheim, mm -hmm. uh, which is where a good mate of mine, Trond Andresen, lives. He reckons that Tamer was named, named after him a thousand years ago. <laughs> so I've experienced plenty of Norwegian weather before I got oh, here. Oh, that's good to hear. Um, and also, you will be interested to know that Professor Keen uh, got off to sort of a flying start uh, because today at the university he was told to shut up by uh, the leading economist, uh, Norwegian economist, Which Kalimuna. Which has never happened before. Mm. Uh, and I've always, obey I've always obeyed the advice too. <laughs> Pardon me. But, but uh, I think that's a, that's a good starting point um, in talking uh, to you or t with you. Um, what is it, do you think, that makes your way of expressing your views so uh, provoking to many people, uh, especially other economists? Uh, it's a combination of things, uh, p partly because like most, there's, there's, there's a lot of non-orthodox economists. Uh, if, if, if to give, give a rough idea of how many people don't believe the mainstream but are professional economists, the best thing I've seen is in France, which has a very hierarchical system, so we know there are roughly 1800 academic economists in France, and about three or four years ago they tried to form a heterodox unit, which was suppressed by Jean Tirol. Uh, he, he managed to persuade the government not to go ahead with creating an alternative division. But of that 1,800, 300 applied, mm -hmm. which means roughly one in six is outside the mainstream. Or think they are. Or think they are. Okay, mm -hmm. but they're willing to put their necks out at the stage of actually applying to join a new association, yeah, which is fairly, right. fairly significant. Um, but what I, one of the, the leading chapter in my book, Debunking Economics, is called No More Mr. My nice Guy. And I don't know where I get it from, but I see a lot of people, they try to be polite in making their case, and they've been polite for a century, and some of them are rude, like Jane Robinson was famously rude. Um, but there's an extent to which they'll concede the mainstream some points, and the mainstream listens to you, absorbs, and moves on, and, it, and, and, and absorbs a caricature of what you've said, and then uses that as their new clothes and keeps walking on. And I said, I've had enough of this. I've had a century of trying mm. to prove you. Actually, it's, it's going on 125 years mm. since the fundamental foundations of mainstream economics were shown to be false. Mm. And one and a quarter centuries, I'm willing to be rude. There is this, there's this saying that uh, when you experience um, this kind of resistance, it's that first they ignore you, and then they ridicule you, and then they steal your, the credit for your ideas. That's pretty much it, mm. yeah. <laughs> and, and where in that uh, progress are you now, you think? I, th I think the middle one, because okay. I mean, the, what, before the financial crisis occurred, every, every economics department has got a non-conventional thinker, guaranteed, because it'll happen in one of several ways. Either by accident they get hired, which is the way that I got in, uh, in the sense that my, uh, the, re the very first job I got as an academic, I was working in the public service uh, in Australia, and I was reading the academic literature and wanting some things to be raised and seeing it wasn't being raised, I thought I've got to go back and try to do it myself. The reason I got hired was the secretary of the professor at the University of New South Wales knew me through my work in overseas aid. And the professor was a humanist, very pr progressive, the, the sort of economist who used to exist and run mainstream economics departments have been driven out in the last 50 years. He took her advice, I got a job there. But most of the time what happens is somebody swallows this stuff practices the neoclassical stuff for some time and then goes through some sort of epiphany and they either change into a Marxian or an Austrian or they find post-Keynesian economics. So even if they try to drive us out, they spontaneously, li like a nuclear fission, they turn into a different particle. They go from uranium to something more stable <laughs> and, and that happens all the time. Mm. So th we've always, and I've, totally com I've, I've had two glasses of wine and I've forgotten the point of the question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think you, I think you managed okay. adequately, uh, <laughs> but uh, instead of uh, repeating it, I think we can kind of expand on it because mm. 
something I've, I've been reflecting on sometimes, um, listening to economists and their debates, yeah. is a, a sort of fundamental question is, is economics, the way it's taught and practiced today, is it a belief system or is it, is it science? The answer is yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because I think all, all, all sciences are fundamentally belief systems. Mm -hmm. and this is, it, it's, a, it's a complicated thing to get your head around, but I, I've got a friend who's a totally anti-religious. He's my best, my, one of my best mates in Australia, and he is totally anti-religion. He's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a very aggressive atheist, and he teaches scientists as being the opposite pole to people who believe in a religion. Mm. And my point has been that, look, Scientists actually believe when they when they develop a theory, they believe the theory explains the real world. Mm. So they've got the same sort of foundation as somebody who believes Jesus explains the real world, or Muhammad does, or Buddha, or whatever else. Mm. But what the scientists have, have developed is a system which they try to prove they're right, and then things go wrong in the experiment, and they prove they're wrong. Mm. Now economics is insulated from that because we can't conduct economic experiments, despite what some neoclassicals are now claiming. You simply can't simulate an entire economy with real people. Um, so they, they don't end up contradicting their beliefs. Mm -hmm. And therefore they have behave, rather than behaving like scientists ultimately, where scientists think, okay, there's a real place for empirical work to criticize and maybe demolish our theory. And we're willing to admit there are contradictions. So mm -hmm. physics, in physics, people get taught that there's quantum mechanics and relativity, and they're inconsistent. Mm. At, the, at each other's scales, they're inconsistent. They're happy to cope with that, and they then want to resolve the problem. Neoclassical economists want to prove capitalism is the best system that has ever existed. Okay, and, and that mathematically stops them, mm -hmm. they go back into the belief mat attitude. And n now, after starting off on a sort of a philosophical note, we are narrowing down to the, the core issue here. Mm. Yeah, and the core issue, to my understanding, yeah. is that there is one claim that a capitalist or a, um, a capitalist <coughs> system is inherently stable. Yeah. Or the, and there is another claim uh, made by you, among others, that it's inherently unstable. 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 Yeah. 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 So, um, and and that's that creates a lot of you know um, emotion. That's a lot where the tension comes from. And the funny thing is that they, it, it's because I'm getting, I've got to strip down for two reasons. One is one is it's too hot in here, and the other I'm wearing a very appropriate T-shirt that I want to show you off right now. Mm. Which is, <laughs> my girlfriend's no. not here. Mm. Uh, stability is destabilizing. It's one of the classic lines from Hyman Minsky. Mm. And Minsky was quite happy to have the concept that a system could be unstable. But neoclassical economists began in the 19th century by saying, well, we want to model this really complicated system. And uh, we know it's complicated. We know we should model it as an unstable system or a, a dynamic system. But that's too difficult. So let's do it with statics right now. Mm -hmm. Let's as humans at rest and work out under what conditions it reach a state of rest. And I don't know how many of you, I'm a bit of a Star Trek fan. And there's one episode in the new generation where the Borg, who are this evil species of neoclassical economists living on the other side of the galaxy, <laughs> and they, they decide to try to attack them by giving a problem which is insoluble. Uh -huh. But they'll continue trying to solve it and finally the whole system will shut down. And that is exactly what happened because they built this model of equilibrium and they couldn't prove that it was stable. And 20 or 30 years later, mathematicians accidentally proved it was unstable. But because they made equilibrium, it went from being a way of handling something that was too complicated for dynamics to a religious belief. And from that point on, anything that challenges equilibrium, they see threatened by. It's heresy. It's heresy. I mean, they think it's the fucking real world. Pardon me. Being Australian, um, you can edit that one out. One of the things that's being said about you constantly is that you predicted the financial crisis mm -hmm. of uh, about ten years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, did you? Yes. <laughs> Next question. All right. Uh, uh, how did you <coughs> manage to do that? It actually it's it's out of what I did in my PhD thesis because I when I revolted against mainstream economics, which they put a date in that was about August of 1971. Um, I then started reading critical literature in economics, and you'd read a lot of Marxians who talked about capitalism have a tendency towards stagnation. And that didn't make any sense to me at all in looking at the real world. And I ended up crit critiquing Marx as well. Uh, you read various other interpretations, and none of them gelled until I read Minsky, and Minsky's basic point was that he said that, that um, capitalism has a tendency to turn doing well into euphoria. 
Mm. He said, because we have an experience of crises in the past, if you have a period of stable growth in a capitalist economy, everybody starts to forget the previous crisis and therefore starts to have rising expectations, therefore they're willing to gamble more than they were beforehand. So he said, the tendency to turn doing well into a speculative boom is the fundamental instability of a capitalist economy. Mm. And also said that the fundamental... And that has to do with psychology. Psychology, but also money. And this is mm. the essential point. So I, I thought that was brilliant because all the other critiques saying capitalism heads to stagnation, it just didn't make any sense to me at all. Mm. Here's an argument saying the fundamental instability is not downwards, it's upwards. But to finance the upwards, we have to borrow money. Mm. And by borrowing money, we set off the process that both gives us the boom and then causes a crash later. Mm. And that was so powerful. So what I decided to do in my PhD thesis was model it because Minsky tried to model it himself. He used a model that I knew was bad as a foundation. And I was doing... He'd done mathematics as well. I'd done mathematics too. Um, but I, I knew, probably with the benefit of 40 years or so of mathematical progress, I knew his foundation was the wrong one. And I found one that was what I saw as the correct foundation. And when I built the model, what it generated was quite remarkable. I was trying to simply simulate a debt crisis. Okay? But what I got out of the model was initially there would be a period of diminishing cycles in employment and effectively inflation. I had a proxy, but it was effectively inflation. And I, when, you, when you graphed it in three dimensions, you had a sort of employment rate here, how much work has got of output there, and vertical is the level of debt compared to GDP. It was like a spiral that was heading towards uh, equilibrium and then destabilised on the other side, like a cyclone. Like if you imagine like an hourglass, going up to an hourglass and out again. So you'd head towards stability and then out again. Mm -hmm. And I first showed it to my, one of my mathematics uh, colleagues in the department. He's, I still remember him saying, Steve, if you've identified anything that exists in actual capitalism, we're in deep, deep trouble, <laughs> which I thought was a great line. Uh, but it turned out to be reality because the model predicted a period of a moderation before the crisis. Mm -hmm. That's what occurred. So I, did, I built the model in August of 1992. And that's before this tendency for inflation and unemployment volatility to fall became part of the data. But what my model made me look at, because it's Minsky's idea, was, was what was happening to private debt as well. Yeah. And private debt was rising. And in that situation, my model, a combination of rising private debt uh, would give you diminishing volatility, but it would lead to a crisis. So I didn't just predict, I didn't empirically predict the date of the crisis or who, which bank had failed or anything like that, but the qualitative characteristics yeah. were that there'd be diminishing cycles in employment and inflation followed by a crisis caused by debt. And that's what happened. Who did you tell this to? Uh, every bloody journalist I could find, because <laughs> the way it actually came about, I, I did my finished my PhD in in '96, effectively. I published in '98, and then I decided to write Debunking Economics, the first volume of it in '99. I published yeah. that in 2001, and then because as part of that, I ended up writing doing what I didn't expect. I wrote a new critique of neoclassical theory, the theory, theory of competition, and neoclassicals went for my jugular. That's because they couldn't get down here uh, to try to rip me apart. So I spent years fighting them over this, this issue of the theory of the firm. And then in 2005, I was finally going to write my PhD as a book. Mm. And out of the blue, I was approached by um, the uh, Legal Aid Commission in my state to be an ex expert witness on a case of predatory lending. Mm. And at the same time, there were journalists coming up to me saying, look, Steve, this thing, who knew me said there's something seriously happening with the mortgage market and debt in this country. Yep. We want you to talk about it. And I said, look, I can't because I don't, I haven't looked at the data for 10 years at that stage. I'm not willing to stick my neck out unless I actually know the data. Then I got this expert witness case, and this is in December, November, December of um, 2005. And as, when, when you're an expert, you're actually hired by the, you're paid for by one of the um, plaintiff or defendant, but you're, hi you're actually effectively an employee of the court. So, so you can't make any hyperbolic statements like a barrister can. Mm. You know, you've got to actually base it. So I wrote this line during my report saying, debt to GDP ratio has been rising exponentially. Mm. And I knew I couldn't rely on a hyperbole. I had to justify the word exponential. And I thought, well, I'll go get the data for Australia. It won't be quite exponential, but it'll be something rising and I've got to change the word. Then I took a few hours to write the routines to import the data, mm. match them to time. I plotted it and I just went, holy shit. Uh, it that's from around three? Pardon? Uh, how much does it rise? Pardon? How much did it rise? Oh, the debt level, th this is Australian debt data starting in about 1965 and going through to 2005, so 40 years. Mm -hmm. And it rose from about 
40 percent of GDP to 140 mm. percent and the only reason it wasn't a perfect fit for an exponential curve is there are two hyper exponential bubbles on top of it and I don't know how many do correlation coefficients for breakfast around here but I got a correlation coefficient between a simple <laughs> exponential the level in 1965 uh, multiplied by e raised to the power of a, of a 0 0.42 it was times t and that correlated with the actual data of the correlation coefficient of 0.9912. Uh, please raise a hand, anybody who understand that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ah, we have five or six. It's almost the Austrian, it's almost the right vote that Hitler reckoned he got in Austria. <laughs> uh, you know, the correlation was ridiculous. And I thought, I'm absolutely justified in using the word exponential for Australia, but is this just a domestic phenomenon? Mm. Well, I knew I, I, I downloaded the American data, did the same thing. Correlation coefficient from 1952 to 2005, in this case, is about 0.97. Yeah. And I went, th th this can't continue. When the rate of growth of private debt stops, there's going to be a crisis. Somebody has to warn about it. At least in Australia, I'm the somebody. Mm -hmm. So the next day, I rang the journalist who'd been really particularly berating me to get it. It was a guy called Stephen Long who works for the ABC. Yeah. And I rang Stephen and said, I'm ready. So he said, right, <laughs> I'm getting, you know, we're going on radio straight away. And that was, uh, I think, December 19 or 20 in uh, 2005. And uh, I didn't publish any academic papers about it because I thought it was just too soon. The time lag in getting something published in an academic journal is going to be three years. So I had to use journalism, media, mm. the blogs, and that's what I did. Mm. <coughs> and what happened in the actual world, in the, in the housing market in Australia? That's the trouble, because I, I finally ended up, like I had a, a lot of, I, I spent a bit of time as a journalist as well, which is why I got on, on well with journalists. I have been one I like. I like the sort of person who gets attracted to being a journalist. So I was... Um, able to communicate effectively on that level that a lot of academics aren't able to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but I ended up finally being interviewed on the 730 report, which is the Australia's leading current affairs program, by a guy called Kerry O'Brien, who's the leading current affairs journalist in the country. The show's half an hour long. Most of the segments are five minutes. I was on for half the show, a quarter of an hour. And the next day, he interviewed the Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd. And he was just hitting Rudd with all my arguments. And Rudd was literally in panic mode. You could tell as he was talking. And a week later, they announced the stimulus package they were going to use. Oh. Now, part of that stimulus package they gave everybody who paid their tax that year, which unfortunately had, did not at the time include me, <laughs> uh, $1,000. They call it a tax rebate. Oh. They instituted a program to build um, what do you call them? school halls at every school in the country. They started doing free insulation for people's houses to, keep, to reduce carbon emissions. And they, th those are the three policies I wasn't particularly opposed to. They were good <laughs> ideas. And they doubled and trebled the amount of money they gave people to buy a house, which meant the housing bubble started all over again. Mm. And I got castigated for not predicting, for, for predicting there was going to be a crisis in Australia and house prices falling. And nobody points out that the government actually, you know, doubled and trebled the amount of money they gave to first-home buyers, literally in a panic reaction to what I was predicting would happen. So Australia is one of two countries that didn't have a recession during 2008 in the OECD, the other South Korea. And they've both got huge housing bubbles now. Yeah. And I, I guess your model uh, is still up and running, right? It's still... Oh, yeah, it's still, it's, it's still the real world. So, so many people, me included, are, are very you know, curious to know if there are new crises now in the making. Um, what is it you see when you look around you? Um, the, 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 the thing which my approach, which is based on Minsky's work, mm. is different to the mainstream is, first of all, non-equilibrium. This is, this is an essential mm. element of it. Secondly, it's monetary. And third, debt, private debt plays an essential role. Because when you borrow, well, you don't borrow money from a bank. A bank creates a loan against you and creates the money as well at the same time. So that change in debt is exactly equivalent to change in uh, to the new demand from credit, which we then go and spend. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the major indicator that I use, the level of debt and its rate of change. And the key metrics, roughly speaking, are that one debt's, once debt gets past about 150% of GDP, and once it's growing at something of the order of 10% of GDP per annum or more, then all it has to do is slow down slightly and total demand in the economy falls. Asset markets cop at first, and then it f runs through to goods, and s goods markets and unemployment rises. Mm. On that basis, Norway's cooked. 
<laughs> okay, so it's it's time to buy you know a lot of food and and, and move Not to. Not that it. bad. No, but no. but I mean you've got the fantastic benefit of a huge trade surplus and and, and oil and so on, which is a, a huge benefit to your country, and, and you've managed it pretty well. I must be said, you know, compared to what England did with their oil bounty of the North Sea oil, uh, Norway is leaves mm. the UK in the dust. Um, but fundamentally, you've, you've now got a debt ratio. Uh, like they said, the trigger level means about 150% of GDP and growing at about of the order of 10% per annum or more. Uh, Norway is currently 240% of GDP and growing at about 8%. So you're one of about between 9 and 16 countries that I think are going to have a crisis just because you can't continue having that rising level of private debt. Mm. So when it starts to slow down, total demand, which is the sum of the turnover of existing money plus credit, which is change in debt, that can actually fall, even though both GDP and debt are still rising. Mm. And you're right on the cusp of that now. Um, is there anything we can do being on the cusp of a, a collapse to avoid it? You can't avoid it, um, but what you can do is attenuate the impact. So that's okay. what Australia did dramatically by hugely expanding government spending, just at the same time as they're going into the crunch. On that front, I can't claim credit for this, but as it happens, the the Treasury Secretary uh, in Australia at the time the crisis hit is the brother of the guy who taught me differential equations. Bit of a laugh, but he's... Uh, and and um, so Ken Henry's the guy, is the, the Treasury Secretary. Bruce Henry's the guy who taught me mathematics. And um, when Rudd asked, asked Bru uh, Ken Henry what to do, Ken Henry said, go hard, go early, go households. Mm. And that's exactly what they did. Huge amount of money to households. Unfortunately, also restarting the housing bubble, but that spending meant that it, it, that attenuated the decline in demand coming out of bank credit. Mm. <coughs> what I'd rather do is use the government's capacity to create money to effectively cancel private debt and reset it. Mm -hmm. But that won't happen. Why? Uh, because it's too. They, they call it radical, because it's. Well, it is. Huh? Isn't it? it is okay. Mm. Uh, it's, it's too much outside what economists have normally done. They, they've always have thought, what they've got to do is modify the interest rate a bit. Mm. And in the old days, they used to think about changing the government deficit a bit. They're now getting back to thinking they should do fiscal policy, which is... They've spent 30 years arguing the government should not run a, a, a deficit at all, which is entirely wrong. But they've convinced themselves over 30 years that makes sense. That's why they've had central banks modifying the interest rate as the only way to try to control the economy. Ten years after the financial crisis, they've finally given up on that and are now starting to talk about the government should run a deficit and so on. But that's deficit and the interest rate. What they are not willing to do is consider the level of private debt still. I, I show them data which is screamingly obvious that I'm right and they're wrong, and they, they simply will not consider doing anything about private debt. So what, what they have done, of course, where, they, where countries have hit this crisis beforehand, the UK, USA, the European Union. Congratulations on deciding not to join the euro. Mm. Okay. Um, what they've done, of course, is what they call quantitative easing. Mm. And what they've done with QE is they buy bonds off the private financial institutions. Mm. Well, what, when they buy the bonds off them, those institutions, the, the income earning bonds go down, their non-income earning cash goes up. So what do they do? They go and buy shares. Who do they buy them off? People who own shares, who aren't poor. So what that does, that's where the huge increase in share prices has come from. Mm. And then that's dramatically increased inequality. Huge extent to which central banks have made the inequality caused by the crisis worse by buying those shares. Mm. Now what I'm saying is, don't buy the shares, cancel the debt that individuals have by giving them money they can use to cancel their debt. Anybody who doesn't have individual doesn't have, if you could make it per capita, so it doesn't just go to the rich, it goes to everybody. Well, that's socialism. That's socialism, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and, but that would reverse the inequality. They've made the inequality of capitalism far worse. Yeah. So I'm arguing you should go and attenuate what you've done. I've got a moral argument in my favour in that sense, but that's socialism, so they won't do it. Um, going back to, to what happened in, because the financial crisis as we see it started in America mm. uh, with the collapse of, of the banks there and uh, eventually they were bailed out mm -hmm. and at the time legislation was put in place to put, sort of try to put some checks and balances mm. on the financial um, industry. Uh, those checks and balances are now being challenged by, mm. for instance, uh, pre President Trump mm. who wants to deregulate uh, the financial markets all over again. Mm. How do you think that will play out? Badly. Uh, but, I mean, I'm, I'm in favour of deregulated capitalism. Mm. 
I'm not in favour of deregulated finance. Mm. Okay, and the trouble because that's what. And what's the, the distinction? The distinction is that uh, capitalism. You're talking about people building factories that make things. You have to hire workers to make them. You've got to have energy as an input, it, and there's costs involved in producing stuff. In banks, it's just double entry bookkeeping, mm. and it's incredibly easy to abuse the privilege of creating money. Whereas if you want to make money as a capitalist, you would be putting your neck on the line. You, you, you want to build a, you know, a system of rockets to fly to, to, um, between cities and, and, and the planet, you are risking your financial viability. Mm -hmm. But if you're a bank, it's incredibly easy to create money for entirely wrong purposes. And in fact, that's what they end up doing. Because to actually, actually find entrepreneurs who are worth financing, find firms that des deserve getting working capital from you, takes intelligence and hard work. That's too difficult for bankers. So what they've ended up doing is they finance asset bubbles. Mm. They say, we'll lend money to you if you have an asset we can back it against, or if we lend money to you which we buy an asset, if you go bankrupt, we take the asset over. So you get this totally irresponsible tendency uh, because it's so easy to make money. It's, it's very hard to make a profit. It's incredibly easy to make money if you have a banking license. Mm. But you want to get a banking license if the state awards it to you, you know, and that means therefore the, the society should put conditions and standards on your capacity to use that power and we instead we deregulate and say here's a license to print money literally um, don't abuse it please and do whatever you like <laughs> so um, on that note are you essentially pessimistic about the prospects of the world economy uh, in the sense that you think it will collapse finally uh, and, and it, it won't collapse um, because we're not in the 19th century Mm. And in the 19th century, the scale of government spending was trivial. Uh, and, and so what you had was government spending wasn't particularly related to the level of economic activity either. So if you had a, um, uh, a downturn in the real economy, that didn't affect government taxation on income because there was no income tax. Mm. Okay? It, it might affect customs duties, but that's pretty trivial. And the government tended to go in the same direction. So you look in the 19th century, every 5 to 15 years there was a financial crisis. Okay? Uh, now, after the Second World War in particular, government went from being roughly 5% of GDP to 30% plus and, and, there, and had income tax and, and unemployment benefits and so on. So when the private sector goes down, the government spending necessarily goes up, even to the politicians who want to stop it. It's like an air conditioning system in this room, which it desperately needs right now. Okay? Um, you know, the air conditioning system would reduce the temperature we we're all generating because of the humanity in the room. Yeah. One of my favourite jokes is this is a very Australian joke. Two people on a tram in Australia sweltering in the temperature. And one says to the other, it's not the heat, it's the humanity. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there is a, a buzzword, especially among many politicians these days, and it has been around for quite a long time now. It's called austerity. Uh, yeah. uh, austerity meaning that you have to manage the economy like you manage a household, mm, I guess, mm. that you have to spend less than you earn. Yeah, that's impossible. This is, this um, is, this, but this it, is, it is what prevailing in many it's countries. It's prevailing and it's yeah. total bullshit. And the simplest way to illustrate it, who, 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 plays, who plays Sudoku here? I it's Sudoku, okay. So you can handle a grid of three by three numbers. <laughs> okay. That's, that's, I've worked a little way of explaining this just using a simple grid of three by three numbers. Because if you imagine yourself being a part of a, a three-sector economy, I call it Tom, Dick and Harriet sometimes. So I can call it agriculture, industry, um, to, uh, services. I can call it Belgium, Spain, Germany. It doesn't matter. But divide it into three sectors and then say one of those sectors wants to save money. So it wants to spend uh, less than it earns. You see, and you, just, I'm going to force you all to think about a numerical display of numbers there. Imagine you've got these three sectors. Each spends... 100 krona a year on the other sector. So their expenditure is 200 krona. They spend 200 krona. Those other two sectors each earn 200 krona, so nobody's saving any money. Then one of the sectors, let's call him Tom, decides he wants to save money. So Tom decides to spend 190 rather than 200 and still earn 200. So Tom spends 190, gets 100 income from the other two sectors, saves 10. What's happened to the other two sectors? Their income has fallen by five each because Tom is spending five less on them. They're still, so they're earning 195 each. They're spending 200. They've not got a deficit of minus five each. So the savings of Tom has been a drop in income for the other two. Mm -hmm. That's the essential lesson of macroeconomics. Your savings is directly somebody else's drop in income. 
because expenditure at the national aggregate level is income. If I buy, if I buy a glass of wine, thank you, red wine, uh, from the bar over there, that expenditure becomes income for the bar. It's necessarily the case. If I decide not to buy that red wine, hang on to the money myself, their income, in that sense what it could have been, is lower. So savings by you as an individual is a drop in income at the aggregate level. But once you've got that in your head, next question is, how do we save money then? The only way we can all save money is there's some other sector that dis-saves, some other sector that always spends more than it gets back in income. The government can do that because it owns its own bank. Yeah. You know, it does austerity instead, it's taking money out of your banks. Um, so austerity is dropping your incomes. So when, and when, we look, when you look at Europe now, yeah. uh, countries like Greece, for instance, mm. that has been put through a, a very severe uh, you know, treatment of so-called austerity. Yeah. Um, how do you think? Um, do you think the, the 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 lack of results? Because what was said uh, when the austerity programs were implemented mm. was that this will kind of you know help Greece on the way on the path to a better future. For most Greeks, it's not like that at all. Uh, the, uh, Greece is going to become Europe's Somalia. Mm. Okay, unless unless you reverse direction and you'll start getting Greek pirates again. Um, it, it's appalling, and it's a beyond, beyond a joke what's happened there. But what economists tend to do is, if it doesn't work the first time, do it harder. Mm. It'll work, okay? And one thing, I've, I've, uh, one person I've criticised a lot in my writing is a guy called Olivia Blanchard, and I have to give Olivia very great credit here because, as well as we now correspond, and he's, I think he's slowly becoming more uh, open to different ways of thinking, he also had a memo that he wrote in 2010, I think, maybe 2012, saying we shouldn't do the program on Greece. You see, no country has ever absorbed the level of austerity we're talking about. The impact could be really, really drastic and it could actually increase Greece's debt ratio. It was leaked by somebody, not by him, about two or three, about a year ago, I think. It's actually the screensaver on my computer. <laughs> uh, so I have to have, he had, the, he had the internal audacity to say we shouldn't do this, but they still went ahead and did it anyway. Mm. So that, that program, because if you, another way to think about this too is Greeks' debt ratio is more than 100% of GDP. Let's say it's not 200, let's say it's 200%. That's two to one. If you decide you want to reduce uh, government spending by 10%, so you'd 200 minus 10 on the top, because as I said, it also reduces income <laughs> on the bottom, you've got 100 minus 10 on the bottom, you get 190 divided by 90, which is bigger. So the attempt to directly reduce your debt level by cutting expenditure, because it also cuts income, we're talking about the government, it's the biggest entity in, in the country, that increases the debt ratio. Mm. Even at the simple level of numerical analysis, it's stupid. But they continue doing it. Mm. Uh, have you read the book by Anis Varoufakis about how he met the US or Euro European establishment? When oh, he shit, was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he, he's a great he, piece of writing. I, I highly recommend that. So, yeah, it's, it's, adults in the room. It's quite interesting. But he, he describes a meeting he had with some people, top level people in, yeah. in uh, the ECB, I think. Yeah. And he explained to them that this isn't working. Mm. It's, it's actually the opposite, it's making thing, things yeah. worse for us. And the, the person responded that we know that but we have to send a strong message. This is partly what they're doing. Greece is being sacrificed. The, a, a large part of the thinking behind the Euro zone is, that, is what's called auto-liberalism, which is a particular sect of economics coming out of Germany. And it combines a sort of a free market orientation of what are called Austrian economists mm -hmm. with a German belief that one should have strict laws and rules. So auto stands for order, effectively. Ordered liberalism. And the part, again, it's the whole idea of the, uh, the Swabian housewife, save money, etc., etc. The whole mentality is there. And they see the Euro as a way of disciplining the rest of, the, of Greece, of Europe, to behave like Germany does. Mm. Okay. So the whole idea about showing if you try to break out of it, this is what we'll do to you. Uh, we want to impose discipline on you. And if Greece has to be sacrificed, so be it. Mm. Norway's biggest trade partner is Great Britain. Um, mm -hmm. How do you think uh, Brexit will play out for, for Britain? I voted for Brexit. You did? Yeah, yeah. And the reason was uh, because, first of all, economists are obsessed with the idea of specialisation, comparative advantage, all this stuff. It's nonsense. Um, but that's, th they, think that they, they think growth comes from specialisation. Now, and then they see it at the national level. So anything, they think, all they think they can do to make the economy grow better is to have more 
lower tra tariff barriers, have more free trade agreements, etc., etc. And politicians enjoy the whole thing too because they get to fly to some nice foreign destination. <laughs> they won't do anything naughty in the hotels, will they? <laughs> uh, and, and enjoy the whole thing and be seen and photographed and so on. So the idea of reversing and going from a part of a trade group to breaking away soon is catastrophic. My opinion is that credit's the main thing that drives the economy and if credit's growing, the economy will grow. And specialisation is drastically overrated. In fact, it probably reduces mm. national wealth rather than increasing it. So I didn't see any particularly big negative consequences for leaving the euro for Britain. But I, I said, well, I call myself a Groucho Marxist. I'm in a club. Do I want to belong to this club? The answer is no. So I voted for Brexit. I want to see the European Union... I want to see the Eurozone fold. The best thing that could happen would be going back to national currencies. And I thought Britain leaving is a polite way of saying that rather than a rude way, which France might have done if Le Pen got elected, and which Italy may well still do. So it was a bit of a, a shot over the bows of the Brussels dictators, because that's how their behaviour is. They're not democratically constrained in any fashion whatsoever. It's a shot over their bows to say, back off, reverse direction. Mm -hmm. Of course, the Brits have stuffed it up completely. Uh, does that mean that you also uh, applaud um, that President Trump wants to, or has already pulled out of these international trade oh, agreements. Oh, the TTIP, I'm glad that's been sunk. That's one of the mm. good things Trump has done because you look at the TTIP, that, that's that the Trans-Pacific uh, uh, Trade in Investment Partnership, I think it stands for. Yeah. And that, uh, again, it's all dressed up as free trade. But in fact, what happens behind the scenes in a lot of these agreements as well is that some particular industrial lobby group will get hold of the negotiating team and draft it to their benefit. And it's particularly the pharmaceutical industry that's done that. And, and also the transnational corporations don't want to be constrained by national governments at all. So they've set up, um, I, I've forgotten the name of the particular court they've established, but a, st a court where they can resolve disputes between co corporations and national governments. So for example, if your national government bans tobacco, they can sue you for reducing their profits and get the law reversed. Now that's built into TPIP, those sorts of, I want to get rid of that crap. We should not treat corporations as individuals. They should be constrained. And equally, the pharmaceuticals thing, that's, uh, a lot of that is, is companies wanting to hang on to their pharmaceuticals patents and stop places like India producing cheap medicine for AIDS and things like that, or cholera. Mm. Um, so it, it's actually a Trojan horse for really... It, I, first of all, I don't, I don't believe free trade is, uh, th is the ideal way to go forward. But secondly, all these Trojan horse takeovers are inside there, and I want to block them. So that's the one, one of the few things Trump has done that I was thought was good. Mm. During his campaign, um, President Trump, uh, apart from saying huge and bigly all the time, he also said China a lot. Uh, How did he pronounce it? He? China. 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 Yeah, 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 China. Yeah. Um, but I guess the, the reason he did that is he feels that China and the rise of China as an as a international superpower yeah. is a threat to American interests. Mm. Um, you have been worried about the prospects of a bubble in China too. Oh, the China's got a huge bubble. Uh, what does it look like? Um, well, f first, first thing I've got to say about China is that I, I went there in 81, 82. Mm. I took a group of Australian journalists for a conference with a Chinese journalists, the first that Chinese had ever done. And I was very impressed, not with the, most of the plans in the mainland, but the plans for the Shenzhen Free Trade Zone. Because mm -hmm. what they were going to do is exploit a loophole in the American trade uh, legislation that meant that to benefit developing countries, if you exported components to that country, had it worked on and re-imported back, you didn't pay any tariff on the gap. Mm -hmm. So the Chinese knew of that. That's the main loophole. They were encouraging American corporations to relocate production to the free trade zone. And of course, what they do by doing that is they go from paying American wages and having American costs of land and stuff like that to paying Chinese wages, which at that stage were about 1 50th of American wages. Huge increase for the profit level for the American capitalists who own the firms. Goodbye to the jobs of the working class Americans who used to have them. The Rust Belt developed out of all that. Trump latched onto that anger, and he was quite right to do it. But the Chinese were incredibly clever. They knew they were going to exploit that loophole, and they also knew that this sort of thing had been going on for over a decade at this stage, but most third world countries that had done this simply said, come over, take advantage of our cheap wages. And then when the wages rose because of the demand for labor, they'd move off to another country. Mm. So the Chinese said, as well as taking advantage of our, uh, you know, this loophole and low wages and so on, you must have a Chinese partner. And within five years, 
the Chinese partner has to own 50% of the business. Mm. Now, just imagine that, okay? The, 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 the wage advantage was so great for American corporations relocating, they're willing to put up with that. That's where Foxconn came from. So the Chinese quite deliberately created a new capitalist class and built a incredibly successful blend of an authoritarian political system with a capitalist economy. So I've got great admiration for what the Chinese have done. We did sort of the same thing with the oil. With the oil? Back in the day. Yeah, yeah. 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 We invited the Americans in and then we kind of took over after a while. Good on you. Okay. Uh, Americans need more of that. Mm. Uh, but what, what he's seeing, of course, is the ri rise of arrival. And the Chinese, I mean, I, I, if you ask a question here, what was the opium wars about? Can anybody tell me? Okay. I bet if I asked Americans or British what the opium war was about, which is a war with China, they would thought they were fighting China to stop China exporting opium to America and <laughs> England. It was the other way around. <laughs> the, it, the, the Americans and English didn't make anything the Chinese wanted. Chinese goods were far superior. The one thing they could sell to the Chinese was opium. So the Chinese government blocked the exporting of opium to China and America and Britain fought a war to enable them to continue exporting opium to China. Now, the Chinese know this and they, they know they were the most powerful empire in the world for many centuries and they know they were degraded by this period when the West invaded and, and you know, drug their own, own people to get their goods back in the other direction. There's a large amount of rebuilding an empire, very deliberate uh, behavior by the Chinese on that front. Yeah, and I'm curious about that because I, I listened to all of uh, Mr. Xi's uh, speech to the, the Congress. Oh, right, three and a half hours. Three and a half hours of it translated into English, bad English. And um, <laughs> it was uh, kind of tedious, but he spent a lot of time talking about uh, the next big leap, uh, meaning that, I, I, it's my take on it, that mm. Uh, China wants to transform itself once again from a sort of a factory for the world to mm. becoming a capitalist for the world yeah. or to, to take a leading role in, in, mm. in expanding global capitalism yeah. and building of the three new silk roads, mm. two over land and one on sea. Yeah. Um, but if there's a bubble well, lurking the, 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 beneath the, the surface... There is huge bubble. I mean, the, the rate of growth of Chinese private mm. debt is the fastest in history. I, I did a graph with it. I, com I did a graph where I took the sort of zero date for the, the rate of growth of the yeah. American bubble, which was the 1993, uh, 1980 for the Japanese bubble, and 2009 or 10 for the Chinese bubble. And the American bubble goes like this, the Japanese one goes like that, and the Chinese is like this. It's like an absolute rocket. So they went from a priv recorded private debt level in 2010 of about 110% of GDP to 220% now incredible increase so and that's where all those ghost cities came from yeah. and those ghost cities themselves have financed a lot of uh, industrial development in china because a huge part of the industry is state owned and state owned i, I mean local councils but the local councils have populations of 20 million and uh, those local councils then build factories the output of which is counted as part of the gdp of the country so it's all tied up like that so when the credit stops running, there will be a crash in the credit mm. system, but the Chinese can instantly flip over to government spending. Yeah. They don't have the same you know, hassles that the West has in understanding and doing it. And that's li I think a large part of the Silk Road is to continue the stimulus, no, rather than building ghost cities in China, which really are a waste of time. Uh, they can be building roads which the Chinese own with Chinese labor, building it, revenue back to China as well. So. I think they've got more of a capacity to attenuate the downturn. Mm. But there are plenty of countries that don't, and those like South Korea, great country to be having a financial crisis right now. Mm. Um, Canada, Australia, Belgium, they, they're going to have a slump and they won't have anything like the Chinese balancing. So China's by far the biggest. Mm. It will have a slump, mm. but they can attenuate a bunch but faster Their, ch their chances of recovery are better. Yeah, I think so. Mm. Yeah. Uh, there is room for questions. Uh, now we have 10 minutes left, so if anybody has questions, please just raise a hand. And we have a mic here and everything. Please. Yep. I guess you have things you want to ask. Getting a mic through this crowd is going to be fun. Uh, it's going to be fun. <laughs> Are they, you, or you could, I could just repeat the question if there's a... Uh, professor, you said the government should, uh, in short, subsidize, subsidize the public loan and give them some maybe equal amount of money to reduce the debt. But uh, isn't it dangerous because if government starts help people printing by printing money, reducing their debt, then people will be building up debt for future. Maybe once you do it, then second time people will know if we did a lot of loans, government will come us and uh, come to us and reduce the loan. 
Do you want to repeat it for the benefit of the camera? Or yeah, yeah. The question is briefly: Is that is it dangerous uh, for for governments to to um, subsidise or finance uh, or reduce the, the private debt? Um, yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of things that can go wrong if the government does that without other doing other things to prevent flow-on effects. So, if you, for example, if you simply used the government's capacity to create money to cancel private debt and didn't change how banks were allowed to lend for asset bubbles, you'd have another asset bubble the next day because the banks would have a lower level of income earning debt and they'd want to increase it and bang, we'd be back in another bubble again. Uh, so those are the sorts of dangers. You have to change what finance companies are allowed to lend for as well as doing what I'm talking about, what I call uh, um, modern debt jubilee. But the, the dangers are really on the e effects of it rather than whether it's possible. And this is the mistake we make. People say, where's the money coming from? You know, how are we going to find the money? You don't find it, you make it, literally. And the government simply, in the case of England, for example, they've done this on a gigantic scale for the financial sector. So in the UK, quantitative easing, when it began in 2010, I think, was roughly, I think it was actually precisely 200 billion pounds worth in that one year. Now, what are the, how, do they, how do they find the money? They simply effectively said, we're going to put that number in your, in your deposit accounts with us, because they were buying off the financial sectors who, who have accounts at the Bank of England. 200 billion in there, and we're going to buy 200 billion dollars worth, pounds worth of bonds off you. And they did, that was one sixth or one seventh of the UK economy in one year. Now, that's how feasible it is. There's no limit to their capacity to do that, because it's just bookkeeping put a positive entry here for the asset, a negative entry for the liability, and you've created the money. So it's not practical, it, it's, the, it's the consequences of that that matter. Now the consequences of the way it's been done is a huge increase in inequality, massively inflated asset prices. What I'm talking about is trying to reduce the inequality and also bring those asset prices down. But once you've done it, uh, you have to also make sure the financial sector doesn't restart it. But the government has no inability to finance that debt. You see, the government, if the government put an entry in your bank accounts of 10,000 kroner each, none of you would say, I'm not going to spend that money because I don't know where it came from. Okay? <laughs> You'd spend it. Okay? So it's, it doesn't have any inability to create it. It's the consequences of it doing that the matter. But they've already done it, and the consequences are a dramatic increase in inequality when we'd already had the increase in inequality with the financial bubble beforehand. So I'm talking about re doing reverse consequences but being aware of them because in many ways the central banks were not aware of what the consequences are going to be when they did that policy. Mm. Any more? Yeah? Mm. Um, can I She's asking about the, the TISA agreement, um, the Trade in Services uh, Agreement, TISA. Uh, Do you okay. know it? No. no. Uh, but it, generally speaking, it's a, it's a new big uh, trade agreement in mm. services that mm. is being negotiated behind closed doors. Mm. Um, and Norway is implicated in that, mm. it's part of the, the discussion. Mm. And the question is, how do you think uh, such a, uh, an agreement would impact? Oh, I, I, because I don't know the actual detail, it's hard to answer. Mm. but. All these things, uh, large corporations are lobbying for it. And in the case of services, they'd be lobbying probably for free access for financial systems. Um, you know, if you registered in America as a financial corporation, you're automatically registered in Norway, that sort of thing. Mm. Uh, they'd probably be trying to impose American terms rather than Norwegian. They'd probably try to prevent your government putting specific terms back that would inhibit their capacity to establish businesses here, block them. You guys block the euro. You've got to take credit for that. You could do it again if you needed to. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Um, yeah, in the back. Yes, this, uh, professor, this uh, Bitcoin technology or economics, how will that work? Will it stabilize the economics? Will it be a threat to the economics? Or I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I, I think in some ways this is a gigantic tulip bubble right now. There's a lot of positives about the whole idea of blockchain and so on, but some of the design elements really worry me. It's designed by people who believe gold should, is or should be money. So they made it limited to there's only 21 million Bitcoin when that first came in. 
And that to me straight away was a farce because all you had to do is build the blockchain technology and you could have a second Bitcoin, which we've got. There must be 30 or 40 different cryptocurrencies around the world. So it, it, you can't replicate the behavior of gold in the first place. Gold truly is unique on this planet. Uh, but anybody can make another version of Bitcoin, so that's one thing that's wrong. Secondly, uh, the main reason it's got validity is people are using it for black trade on the on the, the dark web. It's a way of buying without actually having money transfer through your account. Um, so that's why it's got a certain amount of legitimacy. But its volatility is far too high to imagine going shopping with it. Because one, one of the characteristics of money that makes it easy is it's simple. We all know if we don't, we, we put a certain number of dollars in our pocket or kroner and walk down to the bar, we don't need twice as many uh, by the time we get to the bar or, or have, you know, uh, have half, twice as much as we need. The volatility itself argues against it being what we would normally use for money. Uh, and also the energy issue is huge. The amount of processing power it takes to, tr to hit, put the next bit on the blockchain apparently is something of the order of 10 minutes of high performance computing time. Uh, we're talking about the, money, the amount of energy needed to verify a transaction being similar to the amount that they need to power a house for a day. And I just think that's too wasteful. So I think that the actual technology itself could be used for a trusted system, the sort of triangular relationship money currently has, rather than trying for this anonymous stuff, which generates a large part of that cost. Mm. We have time for one more question, and then we have, I'm sorry I have to cut it short. I think mm. you were mm. first in line. Um, Talking about austerity, yeah. uh, you seem quite concerned about the private debt level. But am I, are we understanding you right when you're not so concerned about the government debt level? Yes, you're right. Yeah. Because a lot of economists are very concerned about QEs and, and <laughs> what is... Which is almost a proof that there's nothing to worry about. Yeah. <laughs> um, because they, see, economists, well, you, you think economists are experts on money, okay? Anybody who does an economics degree, maybe they don't even realise it's happening, they're taught right in the first set of lectures, money doesn't matter. Okay? They taught what's called the, the, the veil, that money's a veil over barter. That's the expression you'll find in economics textbooks. So they start, they get, get a, a simple logical piece of nonsense that convinces them about doubling all prices and doubling incomes and nothing changes, therefore money doesn't matter. It's its absolute price is not relative. Relative prices are what matter, let's ignore money. They didn't do a models of the macro economy without money in it. Okay? Then they, they, they give advice on how to manage the monetary system based on models that don't have money in it, which is crazy. But that's what, because we regard them as the experts, you think they know what they're talking about, they don't. So they start with this fantasy saying that government over the long run, the government deficit should be zero. Okay? Now, imagine the simplest way to critique that, if you had, if you have a, a system like I have now where the government creates part of the money and the private sector does, the, the, the private sector creates money by lending out more than it gets back in repayments. That's how banks create money. More loans out than repayments in. The government creates money by spending more than it gets back in taxation. Okay? More spending out, less money in, it's creating part of our money supply. Now, if you say the government should run a zero balance over time, and you have an economy which is growing, then over time, the level of government money in the economy will fall to zero percent of the money supply. Okay? That's not what you're trying to do. The, the, they're thinking, again, in a static equilibrium terms. And, and people, because they're so, they've been ingrained in thinking in static, non-dynamic terms, they can think, oh yeah, zero deficit over time makes sense. But if you put that in percentage terms and say what percentage of the money supply should be government created, should that fall to zero, most of them would say, well, no, you need a certain amount. Well, therefore, if the current economy is growing at 3% per annum, the government should be running a 3% of GDP deficit. Okay? It's that simple. Do you understand this now? <laughs> it's more complicated than that too, but that's the starting point. Go home and practice it. Yeah. The, the, um, go the government owns its own bank. Okay, would you be worried about the level of debt you were in if you had your own bank that you could act would actually easily happily cancel your debt if you asked it to as well? I, I call it my wife. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'll be calling your wife. <laughs> <laughs> okay, tack så mycket för att du kom. Thank you, Professor Keen, for an interesting talk. Okay.